Well, good of you to tune in for our Bible study this midweek at Lancaster. Uh, we are in a study of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes uh, under the general heading of uh, the quest for wisdom. We have uh, looked at Job, we've looked at Proverbs, and we are checking out Ecclesiastes right now. And uh, hope you're benefiting from from that. I've been thinking about this book a little bit. Uh, you know, would I really recommend people read Ecclesiastes uh, in the middle of this year in particular, 2020, uh, in the middle of a pandemic and all kinds of social unrest and various things going on this year? Um, you know, it, it one sense might be dangerous. Now, some people think Ecclesiastes to be the most pessimistic book in the Bible, the most depressing book in some ways. And I guess I can understand that. Uh, it's really a book where it's important to keep in mind the entire uh, scope of it. In fact, I don't know if you've ever come across a book before where it's really important to read the last line first, uh, but it certainly is the case with Ecclesiastes. So the book closes, once again, we've read this a couple of times, with these words, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, remember that we're dealing with a book that is presented, let's say, in two voices. The dominant voice of the book uh, is skeptical and pessimistic. Uh, it's the voice of this person uh, in, in the Hebrew original. His name, uh, his title was Kohelet. Now, in our English translation, sometimes he's called the preacher, sometimes the teacher. Uh, he is something like a collector or a gatherer or one who calls an assembly together. Uh, preacher is probably a misnomer for us because we have a certain image of what a preacher is. That wasn't what this guy was. Uh, and teacher as well, um, not in a traditional sense of a teacher, but one who maybe collects um, thoughts and, and wise sayings and that kind of thing, or maybe collects an audience. Maybe that's the thrust of it, however that uh, might be expressed. But that's the main voice of the book. Um, now, at the very beginning and at the very end, there is another voice. Uh, he's not given a title. Let's call him the narrator. Uh, but much more optimistic, uh, more orthodox uh, voice. The, the narrator sort of sets the parameters that we can understand the rest of the book in. He talks about God. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Um, and, and we really have to keep that perspective in mind as we read the rest. Because frankly, a couple of things we'll look at today, we might well wonder, what is this doing in the Bible? <laughs> it just doesn't seem to fit at times. Uh, recall that the the voice of the preacher or Kohelet, however you want to refer to him, the main voice, he is pursuing life under the sun. There's this phrase, under the sun, and it's parallel phrases, under heaven or on earth, that occur 30 to 40 times throughout the book. This is how he is pursuing life. And, and under the sun means basically without God, without a godly perspective. This is how he's pursuing meaning in life. And so he's frustrated, he's pessimistic, as anyone would be uh, trying to pursue life's meaning simply by what they see on earth. And so this explains why we read what we read in the bulk of the book. All right? And... Um, another thing to keep in mind. Really important in this book not just to plow into the middle of it and try and figure out what in the world is this about. 
without understanding where it's coming from and and these two voices and so forth another major word in the book and this is a little bit of review here at the beginning is this word vanity or futility <clears throat> we'll hear him say repeatedly vanity of vanities all is vanity uh, this is from the word hevel in the original it occurs about 40 times in the book and it means something like emptiness uh, it can be translated like a vapor and as we said last time originally it's the name of Abel uh, back Genesis chapters 1 through 3 uh, the son of Adam and Eve who was killed by his brother Cain and uh, this pessimistic uh, voice of Ecclesiastes time and again looks at things and says eh, it's all vain Life is vain under the sun. And, you know, his basic perspective on life is life under the sun is full of trouble and then you die. And that's why I said, you know, um, would I recommend reading it <laughs> in, in 2020? Well, yes, if we understand the, the perspective. Uh, because if we understand where it's coming from, we understand chapter 12 verse 13 then we can um, appreciate the wisdom that is found okay so a couple of things uh, to, to think about specifically today that's new the writer goes through some major vanities of life vanities of life under the sun and I just wanted to note oh, about five of those with you and the texts that exemplify them here in our study today. So we start out in chapter 2. Uh, let me get a little coffee so you know what time of the day I'm recording this. Excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 15. He talks about, of all things, wisdom being vain. So it's, it's human wisdom that is... Wisdom pursued without reference to God. Wisdom under the sun. Chapter 2, verse 15. Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been for long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Uh, it's, it's often the case in reading Ecclesiastes, you, you get the feeling this guy was just having a bad day uh, when he wrote it. And so here's this, this man who has pursued wisdom. Um, many think, you know, this is Solomon at some point of his life. And we know that Solomon, you know, he's described as the the source, the, the fountainhead of wisdom in the Old Testament. Um, the wisest man on earth. Uh, well, we know that parts of his life weren't devoted to wisdom. And here he is sort of lamenting that he ever pursued wisdom uh, because he basically says, you know, in the end, uh, the wise and the fool both die and nobody remembers them. Well, if you're looking at life without God, um, that makes sense, okay? Uh, if you're if you're pursuing a relationship and with God and you're devoted to Him, that doesn't apply. Um, so uh, he he rails against the value of human wisdom here. Calls it vanity, emptiness. The next thing is labor, work. Okay, just a few verses later, verse 18, listen to what the writer says. Again, we're in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. 
So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. You hear what he's getting at there. He's worked hard and with great wisdom, and yet uh, you know, he's going to have to leave it to some jerk, some fool, who's going to mess it all up. And so what was the point? Uh, he, he has no legacy to leave. And uh, you see, he, he's the, uh, the preacher, the, the writer, is um, really despairing. And he's in a bad place. Uh, not surprising, he's trying to do it totally without God. And so um, all his hard work, he feels, is, is worthless because he just leaves it to somebody who doesn't appreciate it. A uh, couple other examples of this. Chapter 4, verse 4. Notice what's vain in life here. He says, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is a vanity and a striving after wind. Uh, what's, what's the vanity here? He seems to be saying, you know, what inspires a person to work hard and, and to try and be good at what he does? Nothing but trying to keep up with the Jones. That is, nothing but his rivalry or his competition with his neighbor. And he says, that's vain. You know, if that's the only reason you're doing things, that's vain. So uh, human rivalry or competition, he says, is is vain under the sun. A little bit later in chapter 4, the next one is fame. So human fame. Verse 13. Listen to uh, his bad day continues here. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. Uh, this is one place where people read and they say, does this really sound like Solomon? Um, because it, it, you know, it talks about, uh, sort of in referring to himself, he started out poor and that kind of thing. Certainly that was never Solomon's experience. Uh, so some use that to say there's another writer uh, involved here. But be that as it may, just this idea that you know, it's better to, to be unknown and have a little wisdom than, than, than to be famous because, you know, in the end, what does it matter? Human fame is vain. And then uh, just one more in this, in this idea. Chapter 8, verse 10. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. And so here we have uh, human praise being vain. Uh, that, you know, this person that he saw buried, he used to see uh, at church, temple, and in the city, and they were praised and so forth, and now uh, they're dead. And, and so what, of what good was all that praise that they received? Human praise. So there's all kinds of these vanities of life that, that the writer of Ecclesiastes um, lists. There are others beyond the ones we looked at. So we start, we start to get a feel for his outlook on things and, and on life. And because he has this view, this pessimistic view, 
of life under the sun, uh, Kohelet, the preacher, recommends that while you're young, what, what should you do? Because life is this way, what should you do? He basically says you need to pursue the good life. Um, pursue pleasure and recreation and whatever makes you happy. Um, and it's almost like carpe diem, you know, seize the day because uh, life is going to come to end to an end all too quickly. And so uh, grab all the gusto you can while you can. Um, so there are the, all these what we might call carpe diem texts in Ecclesiastes that have this perspective. Now, here's an example of, of some passages. If you don't understand what's going on in Ecclesiastes, you could pull these out and really preach or teach something that's untrue to people because you're not remembering who said it and, and, and why they said it, where they were coming from. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 24. He says, There's nothing better. Well, think of that. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Okay? You can see how we could rip that text out of its context and say, hey, look, the Bible says there's nothing better than just to eat and drink and find enjoyment in life. And that's from God. Well, it's important to remember who said it and where they said it, right? He's pursuing life, even though he mentions God, he's pursuing life under the sun without God. And that's why he has this perspective, just enjoy everything. Okay, that's the greatest virtue. Uh, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, another Carpe Diem text. He says, I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Okay, you can see, you can take that one and... and uh, double it up with the first one we read and, and, and make that point you see if you're not if you're not careful uh, at the end of chapter 3 verse 22 so I saw that there is nothing better we keep hearing that same rephrase there's nothing better so I saw that there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work for that is his lot what can bring him to see what will be after him so the best thing in life is just to enjoy your work. Hmm. Well, not saying that enjoying your work isn't important. Is that the best thing in life? Is that the most important thing in life? What if you have a job you hate? You know, I, I know people that uh, don't like their work, but they keep at it because there is a virtue in, in work and earning a living and that kind of thing. It's a godly thing. Uh, New Testament says, if, if a man will not work, let him not eat. Okay? Uh, but what about this idea there's nothing better than enjoying your work? Is that really the, the full truth? Well, let's go on a little bit further. Verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. You know, there's parts of that that sound spiritual and God-seeking, but uh, I think if you keep in mind what's going on, you see the flaw in that. Um, 
there's still a real pessimistic undertone if you read that closely. Just a couple more in this to see how this fleshes out throughout the text. Chapter 8, verse 15. He says, And I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, for tomorrow we die, is almost the perspective. And one last one, chapter 9, verse 7. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white, clean clothes. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Take a shower. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. Now, up to that point, you know, it, it sounded pretty positive. You know, uh, eat well and, and be joyful and, and, and drink and, you know, be clean and love your wife. All the days of your vain life, your meaningless, empty life, suddenly that comes in, in verse 9. Enjoy life with, with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought, or knowledge, or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Now that's where he drops the, the pessimistic hammer, there at the end of that text. You go read that, chapter 9, verses 7 through 10, and see how that develops. Uh, you get to verse 10, you're like, what in the world is that doing in the Bible? <laughs> and you, you might start to ask, what is this book doing in the Bible? Well, Again, we have to keep in mind uh, the two voices and the basic perspective of the book. This guy is struggling to pursue meaning basically without God, under the sun, apart from God, and the kind of he comes to. So, you know, 90% of that text we just read sounded great, and then, you know, at the end he says... You know, do all these things, whatever your, your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the grave to which you're going. You know, it's all coming to an end, and, and that's it, so you might as well enjoy it while you have life, because there's no life after death. There's no life in the grave where you're headed is the essence of what he says. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's the basic perspective of the writer, the main voice in Ecclesiastes. I don't know about that 10th verse, if, if when you look at it, if it sounds familiar. Whatever you do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it uh, with all your might. It should if you're familiar with the writings of Paul. Uh, there's a text in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. Sort of close with this. Okay, so again... The writer of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there's no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you're going. Okay? That's life under the sun. Listen to the Apostle Paul, who is always discussing life in Christ, right? Paul says this, Colossians 3, 23, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, 
knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Do you hear the difference in perspective? Uh, Paul says work hard. Uh, he, he implies enjoy your work. But you're not doing it for men. You're not doing it simply under the sun. You're doing it as for the Lord. And understanding that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance. Not that you're going to the grave and all that you have done is going to die with you. And, and so, you know, grab all the gusto you can and all the enjoyment you can now because it's all going to be buried. No. Paul says you're looking for an inheritance, a reward that is coming in Christ. You are serving the Lord Christ. And that is, that is the perspective of the whole of Scripture. Uh, we do have this, this book that reflects on a bad time in a particular person's life. And he's very clear in what he is describing. In essence, life without God, without a true relationship with God. Sure, that's depressing and pessimistic. And there's no hope uh, in that life. But we find uh, when when we meet Christ, that there is great hope. And that gives meaning to, to our toil and, and to our life in this world. Forgive the, the ringing of the phone there. Uh, but that sort of helps me understand and appreciate the book a bit more. Uh, next time, we will... Um, just do some summary thoughts, some things we, we can pull from from the book and um, and maybe uh, begin looking at the next book that we're going to pursue. Uh, but I encourage you to think about these things and hope it's a benefit to you. Uh, it is a risk to read Ecclesiastes, uh, but it's one worth taking. It reminds us of the difference between life in God, in Christ, and life just simply under the sun. Have a great day. God bless.